Hi, this is Teddy, and you're listening to Maggie O'Keefe in Chicago on Two Broad Talking Politics, part of the Demcast Podcast Network. Hi everyone, this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Dumbcast family of podcasts. We are, in light of COVID-19, going to be coming at you a lot more frequently uh, in the coming weeks as more people are getting more of their information virtually. So today I am on with a friend of mine. This is Maggie O'Keefe, who is running for committee woman in the 40th Ward in Chicago. Hi, Maggie. Hello. I feel like I'm a regular now. This is my third time on Two Broads, so thanks for having me back. Yes, indeed. And you were one of our very, very first guests once we started uh, having guests on the podcast. So it is exciting uh, to have you back on the podcast. So let's start with some background. Just you know, sort of, what? Who are you? Uh, what's your background, and and why are you running for committee woman? Yeah, I am a community organizer and a small business owner in the light of the presidential election in 2016. I didn't feel like I did enough of to help folks, but also help myself. And I switched my, essentially my full-time job from doing digital marketing for small businesses and nonprofits, uh, which I still do, but really used those skills that I have and started putting them towards politics and helping people run for office uh, during that time, uh, helping prog- progressive candidates in Illinois run for their seats. I also held and organized deputy voter registrar trainings across Cook County in Illinois, which is our largest county here. Uh, our Chicago is in Cook County and had organized trainings to over 500 people across Cook County to become registrars to register people to vote. From there, you know, you quickly have to turn from an organizer to a manager. People start coming to you being like, where do I go? Where am I going to go register folks to vote? And so I I switched over to um, organizing those types of events. And I found my niche in high school voter registration, uh, voter drives in our in our uh, Cook County high schools um, and all different types of high schools, really mostly focused in marginalized communities because those are the high schools that got back to us. But alternative schools, charter schools, public schools, private schools, you know, you name it. We were in Oak Lawn to Barrington and helped register thousands of people to vote before the 2018 primary. Um, so now, fast forward a couple of years, I ran for alderman in the last election, fell just 625 votes short from getting into the runoff with a 36-year incumbent. But together with four, uh, four progressives running against a, a longtime incumbent, we actually got a new alderman in our community. From there, we saw a 28% increase in voter turnout, and that really solidified for me that the work that we put into our community to get people out and educated and voting uh, has just begun. You know, change and reform takes time, and this is how we do it, by um, running for positions like committee person. And I'm happy to dive into what a committee person does here in Illinois. Yeah, definitely. So, and I will admit, I don't even know enough about what committee people do. And I'm someone who's typically pretty tuned in to to down ballot races, Uh, you know, and this is something that's going to be different from location to location. But I think a lot of places in the country have a a position that's somewhat similar, at least. So, so what is this position? So in Cook County, uh, we have um, what are called committee people. And there is one committee person uh, that is a Democrat, a one committee person that is a Republican in every ward and township in Cook County. So there's actually 80 Democratic committee people and 80 Republican committee people. Committee people is, or a committee person position is an unpaid position. You're part of the Cook County Democratic Party, or on the Republican side, the Cook County Republican Party. And your main job is to help 
run a fair and accessible election. That's why you have two, right? I don't go against a Republican in November. Uh, we have to have both in order to run a fair election. On top of that duty, that very important duty uh, of running a fair and accessible election for all eligible voters. We also increase voter turnout. We register, re-register voters. Um, we um, appoint vacated positions and we make judicial endorsements as well as other endorsements for our community. So we're going to talk some about how campaigning has changed, but I know you have been out on the doors just a ton uh, over the past few months talking to people. When you talk to people, I, I'm curious if, if people even realize this is something that they vote for, uh, if they, you know, what, what sort of reactions you're getting as you're talking to people? Well, for context purposes, in the 40th Ward, that's the ward that I'm running in, our former alderman, who, like I said at at the top, we've we've ousted, is our current committee person. So he actually Mm -hmm. consolidated that power for 35 years. And because of that consolidation of power, we saw lower voter turnout and lower voter engagement. Um, So when we're going out on doors, when we were collecting signatures, which I needed 907 valid signatures, something like that, uh, or 909, I think it was. Out of 10 people that could sign my petition, only one person really knew what a committee person was. So it was very telling to me starting out that we needed to educate people about why getting down to the bottom of the ballot and why a committee person is a position that works for the people every single day. So, you know, it's been a journey for sure, talking to voters about just educating them on what a committee person does. I mean, I'm still having that conversation on the phones with people, you know, when I, I, I get the uh, voters think they're slick sometimes, you know, they're like, oh, well, I'm still looking at my options. And I go, <laughs> okay, well, did, I was like, well, do you know what a committee person does? And they're like, no. So we have to sit down at, you know, and really walk it through. So GOTV right now is still educating some folks, even though we've been to their doors, we've talked to them on the phone, we've texted them, you know, we still have to provide that guidance for them about why it's important to vote for a committee person. And so you have some plans for what you would like to do as committee person. Uh, What, what are the kinds of changes, the kinds of things that, that you could implement if you're in this position? Well, because uh, state law doesn't require it being a separate position, that like just like I said, like our former alderman held both positions. I want to separate this position from our alderman. I am running against our new alderman, and I think it's important moving forward that we separate it, uh, not just because of accountability. But to have more people, more voices in democracy, not fewer, having two people, progressives, really working together, the aldermen working on our constituency services, our our civic engager or our committee person working on getting people out to vote. Um, So really separating these positions is going to be the most helpful to our community uh, and also to gain that trust back. You know, our Cook County Democratic Party doesn't have a great name right now. And that is because we have had this consolidation of power. I mean, you're talking about one of our our most our longest standing aldermen, Alderman Ed Burke, who's currently indicted and is likely going to trial in early 2021, is also a committee person. And he won his election for alderman without having going into a runoff last year with severe low turnout in voting. So separating these positions is going to be what ultimately holds our elected officials accountable, but also be able to run a fair election. What are some things that you think would increase voter turnout, uh, voter registration and voter turnout? You know, what, what are ways we could get people more engaged in this process? Well, having an on-the-ground committee person and having a, a independent ward organization that can go out, go door to door, you know, doing the old school tactics of precinct captains and having people essentially in charge of a of a of a precinct, so that the folks in the neighborhood, the hopeful upcoming voters and regular voters, 
can like know, oh, hey, I can go to this person if my address has changed or I can come to my committee person and have them re-register me to vote. Really creating that um, awareness and that engagement in our in our community and in pockets, I think, is really, really important moving forward. So you mentioned earlier that you had been doing a lot of voter registration in high schools. Uh, obviously, all of that's going to change a little bit uh, in the, the coming weeks. But uh, what, you know, do you have ideas on ways that we could engage young people, uh, brand new voters? You know, what, what sorts of things were you hearing from people? Were they excited to be registering to vote? What does that look like for that uh, younger group of voters? Sure. Yeah. Young people are super getting more and more engaged, more excited about being able to vote. I mean, here in Illinois, we have some of the most incredible voting laws uh, or the least amount of restrictions. So here in Illinois, if you're 17, you can vote in a primary as long as you're 18 uh, on the uh, election day in November, November 3rd. And when you tell that to, to young people, their eyes light up. They're so thrilled that they actually are able to participate in democracy. I think the same issues that we have with folks and adults who don't come out and vote regularly are the same issues that we have with our young people is that they just don't feel like they're being talked to or that their voice matters at this time. And so creating that sense of urgency without instilling panic or fear or anything like that, but creating that sense of urgency that when I talk to adults versus when I talk to young people, you know, I try to give them examples based in their own lives, like why it's important that they use their voice. For young people, I talk about that this is their future. This is the administration that we have now should not should not be creating your future. And then for adults, when they're apathetic to voting, I I talk to them very matter of factly. I go, you know, do you have a person in your life like that has either is incarcerated or do you know somebody that is currently not a citizen and looking to be naturalized citizen? Or do you have a child in your life? And more more times uh, than not, they do. And I go, okay, well, if For example, if you have a child and you're an apathetic voter, I say, well, why don't you vote for them and vote, put your vote towards their voice that they don't have because these people don't have the opportunity to vote right now and you do. So take yourself out of the situation and place these people that don't have the opportunity to vote into, into it. So uh, we should talk about the current situation. So (laughs) Illinois' primary is... Two days, two days from now, as we're talking, uh, and the whole world, literally the whole world, has been upended. So tell me a little bit about what, what that means for campaigns, what sorts of challenges you're facing, uh, what sorts of opportunities maybe it creates, and, and what that all looks like. Well, first I want to say the, the lack of leadership at the federal level really leaves people not at ease, right? Like the absolute opposite. But our leadership here in Chicago and in Illinois with J.B. Pritzker as our governor, Mayor Lori Lightfoot as our mayor, Tony Preckwinkle as our Cook County Board President, you know, they're really making sure that people have the best information, the most current information. They're doing pressers every single day. So I just want to say that, you know, in Illinois, we have we have the opportunity to we have the opportunity to have great leadership and teaching us and telling us exactly how to go about our everyday lives. So I'm uh, really grateful for that. That being said, campaigning three days uh, before an election during a national emergency, you have to be creative. You know, you have to be nimble. And this is kind of what, in some ways, you know, these are, this is a, a very bad time to be campaigning, but it's also, it shows you which campaigns and which strategies of campaigns are the strongest. Because if you're not able to be nimble, if you're not able to really shift your focus to somewhere or something else, then you can call up the leadership what it is. So we personally have shifted from going out at early vote and at doors, um, obviously no one-on-one interaction, 
and shifting our focus onto phones and text messaging. And tonight, we're actually hosting an AMA on Facebook and YouTube Live so that we could reach voters where they are, which everyone is hopefully currently at home this evening, Mm -hmm. and give them that opportunity to have that one-on-one interaction without being in person. Do you think that this is going to change what campaigns look like going forward, even when we are eventually, hopefully, out of this, you know, immediate situation of panic? Do you think that the virtual tools and strategies that campaigns are coming up with uh, are going to have long term impacts? You know, what I, I know nobody can really predict at this point, but what's your sense of that? I mean, one-on-one interaction in person is always going to be the strongest, especially for local races like mine. Um, I can't necessarily say it being strong for presidential or, you know, higher up, higher up campaigns, but always having that one-on-one interaction with the candidate or with the uh, campaign or the, um, the elected official is always going to be the strongest way that you can campaign. That being said, I think with not only the digital age and and all that, you know, really uh, overcoming our lives, uh, or at least being uh, something that we interact with every single day on top of our young people using digital um, all the time as well for their interactions. We definitely have to start being, again, like I said, more nimble going into campaigns, uh, building building doomsday strategies into your campaigns. I don't know if we necessarily have to go there, um, but it's a it's an important lesson as a as a candidate myself to always be ready for whatever ball is being thrown your way. So, you know, moving forward, the things that we've decided to implement are certainly certainly lessons and things that after this campaign is over, I'm going to sit and probably stare out of a window and really think about how we could have done things better or what was what was a really good strategy and things like that. So it's always taking it as it comes and, and then assessing it after the fact. Do you have any thoughts, recommendations, not just in Illinois, but sort of more widely about uh, voter registration, how that could be done more effectively in ways that, you know, it's always going to require some person to person interaction, but, you know, ways we could sort of take lessons from this uh, to get people continuously engaged in this process, even when, you know, crises hit? Yeah, I mean, here's something that's real, right? In in the 40th Ward, we have four closed polling stations um, right now for Tuesday, which is really scary uh, because I'm talking to people on on the phones and I'm seeing that their polling place is, is closed and we're having to essentially create a brand new voting plan for them. I mean, there are people out there that want to vote on Election Day and, and they're not able to do that right now. And I feel for them and... and I, I get wanting to wanting to vote on election day. It's definitely electric, um, but we have to be safe and secure. So, uh, when it comes to voter registration, I guess across the country, like your original question, federally mandating that early vote and same day voter registration would definitely increase voter access and voter turnout. Um, right now, it's not a you know, in Alabama, you, you can't do that. In uh, other places uh, in, uh, across the country, there are no, um, New York does not have early voting. It's election day or bust. So hopefully in this new administration that we do get in 2020, that we can actually look at voting rights as serious as a, as a campaign commitment. Is there anything else that you would like to make sure that we talk about today? Since this is going out the couple days before the primary and for anybody else across the country listening and you have an upcoming election, I urge you to early vote, especially here in Illinois, especially in the 40th Ward. Please early vote. Mm-hmm. Exercise your rights. Um, our uh, board of, Chicago Board of Elections is taking all the necessary precautions that they need to. They have people wiping down stations every time someone votes. Um, it is clean. It is cleanly, and and people are coming out in early voting in mass. So you know, be prepared to potentially wait in a little long of a line uh, or a, wait in a line. But if you can and and you won't compromise your health, go and go and vote if you can. Otherwise, 
you can you can actually request in Illinois having having someone come to your car window and vote as well. Um, but that has to be requested through the Chicago Board of Elections. So these are these are precautionary measures that you can take, you know, um, and it's important to exercise your rights. But of course, your health is always going to come first before that. That's great advice. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you so much uh, for joining me on the podcast again. And thank you, of course, for running for office and for bringing attention to uh, to down ballot races, to important positions like this. And of course, as always, the importance of registering people to vote. Thank you. And if anyone wants to learn any more information about myself as a candidate or uh, learn more about what a committee person does, you can head to our website, maggieokeefe.com. Great. And we'll put that link up on our show notes. Thank you for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Dimcast Podcast Network. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Emu Nuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast. You can contact us at Two Broads Talking Politics at gmail.com or on Twitter or Facebook at Two Broads Talk. You can find all of our episodes at Two Broads Talking Politics.com or anywhere podcasts are found.